Uh, hello, World Experience. My name is Jackie. Welcome to another episode where we get to interview workers that we have opportunity to talk to. Right now, I'm talking to Myrno Pasquale. Pasquale, pardon, but Myrno has been working with humanitarian organizations since 2014 in contexts across the Middle East, East Africa, and Southeast Asia. Primarily, Myrno has worked in refugee and IDP camps as a site manager, managing operations in the sites and working, to, working with communities to improve site conditions. This role has also a coordination function, coordinating not only with the colleagues from fellow organizations, but with various local authorities and United, Na United Nations institutions. Um, and right now you're in Yemen, correct? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and you have been here throughout the entire crisis. Um, but right now, he mainly is advocating for the rights of migrants, civilian victims of the conflict, and other marginalized groups in Yemen. So I'm really thankful that we had a chance to talk. How are you today? Doing great. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm just back home in Pennsylvania with a rowdy dog right next to me. Um, but first of all, can you tell me what it's like living in Yemen? Like, what does your average day look like? Yeah, so Yemen's been in conflict since uh, 2015, 2016, so it's quite quite unstable, but it's never, it never feels as unstable as you would, as you would think. So, I mean, life goes on here. Um, we're pretty locked down, so we don't get to move around too much uh, in, in the markets and stuff, but, you know, life is, life is ongoing, so markets are busy and weddings happen and school happens and, and everything kind of continues as best it can. So it always feels more normal than you would, than you would think and you quickly get used to it. How long have you been in Yemen for? Uh, so I arrived here in February, 2019, so about a year and a half. Okay. Okay. Um, and what are the peaks and valleys of your work? Yeah, it's, there's a lot, you know. Um, I think that this type of work in in humanitarian settings is is always a tricky up and down. Um, you have these really high moments when you're working with teams. I mean, you're working with people from the communities. You're working with uh, people that have been marginalized or fled conflict or fled natural disaster, and that has these great moments of, of teamwork and camaraderie. Um, even sometimes when you're you're your real wins can be limited because the context can just be so difficult. Um, the valleys wouldn't be something, it's not what I expected when I started out. I thought the valleys, the tough parts would really be seeing the conditions, um, which it is, you see tough things and, and people living in, in difficult situations, but um, that stuff is quickly overcome by the, the positive resilience of the populations that you're working with. Uh, and the teams that you're working with. I would say the, the values can just be the, the long, takes a long time to, to change things on the ground. And um, things can really wear you down. So over time, you just start to get tired and tired and tired. Um, you don't recover as quickly and you need to, you need to step out for the break. But um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot different than I expected when I first entered into the sector. Yeah. Um... What made you interested in this kind of work? Because before you came on, me and Jeff were talking. He's like, this is the kind of work that really worries your parents. <laughs> mm. But but also makes them very proud. But what made you very interested in just working and to, like, you know, contribute to helping humanity, if you will? Yeah. Um, I mean, definitely there's an element of just, adventure and excitement, especially when I was starting out. You know, I always wanted to live overseas and, and uh, be in different environments, and I was able to do that. And this was a great way to do that. Um, so that there was definitely that kind of, that reason. I think also uh, I was interested in acute crises. They, they seemed exciting and, and interesting and dramatic, and, and they are in many ways. Um, and that has, that has been fulfilling in that sense. But I think getting into it, it was more about what it came down to was what I learned more about was just kind of committing to these, these principles. You know, humanitarian work is grounded in human rights. It's grounded in humanitarian principles of independence and partiality and, um, and blah, 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 which are really important for how we define ourselves as workers. And that was, the, as I started to get into it, I 
felt closer aligned to those principles and that really became a big part of the driver to stay to stay in it and to kind of grow within the sector right and i was reading your bio but and you said that you went to allegheny college um actually i have family yeah. that went there so what type of organizations were you a part of in allegheny college that helps you work towards this career um, so I was in the environmental science department and I had a close relationship with the political science department and just a lot of it was just my professors. I had great professors who gave me research opportunities to do stuff overseas and to do interesting work or things that I was interested in. Um, in terms of society at school, I was on the, I, I was more of an athlete in school. I, I was on the swim team and I think actually looking back on it, I think that just sports kind of gave me a lot of uh, discipline to you know to kind of push through tough times and it gave me an outlet um stress release is like a huge element in the field uh, and, and exercise and kind of being in tune with that was important uh, more so than i would expect um but yeah but it's a lot of it was just really engagement with my fellow my fellow um, students and colleagues uh, I did, you know, alternative spring breaks, which I really loved. That kind of volunteerism was, was something that I that I gravitated towards. But um, yeah, it was kind of a, a mix of a lot of different things. Nice. Okay. Um, and what are the main things you do to prepare yourself for this work? Because it's you said that life goes on in Yemen, but it seems like you know anything can happen. Um, how do you mentally prepare yourself every day? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, very easy. Um, you very easily get used to it. And, and I think we, it, it's not as proactive as it as it should be. Uh, I think when I am, when I'm doing it well, when I'm preparing myself, and I'm handling my stress, I think that's, that's so much of it is um, trying to kind of sit back in the morning or identify in the morning what's, what your day is going to be like and what are reasonable things that you can get done because oftentimes you have a list of 100 things to do and you're going to get if you're lucky you're going to get 15 of them completed throughout the day and then you take your remaining list and you shift it to tomorrow and you get 20 more things on top of it um, i think setting those expectations about what is what is possible is something that i'm still learning um, as, a, as i've grown in the sector so that's a huge element I think two of the things too, like one of the biggest, best skill sets I think that I've seen other people have is just that ability to handle stress. You know, are you doing um, healthy ways to relieve your stress, doing yoga, exercising, reading, whatever it is. And then thirdly, just really making the personal connections with your colleagues, whether they're other internationals or they're your staff that are from the country where you're working in. Those personal relationships really get you through kind of the tougher elements of, of the work. Um, and you really depend on each other. And that's one of the things I really love about sector is that it's, it's really a tight family. Uh, people look out for each other because you because you have to. And I think fostering those relationships, being open uh, to them and, and being you know vulnerable around your colleagues can be good to kind of build those emotional relationships. And that's going to really get you through like the tough, the tough moments. Yeah. Would you say that you've built a connection with people that are living in Yemen that you would consider close friends? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, um, I mean, most, you know, most humanitarians are not, are not foreigners like me, you know, they're 98% are people that are from the countries where they're living. So, um, you know, for example, I was on the West Coast of Yemen for over a year and we had three foreigners, three expats that were there and we had staff of 85 national staff. So we mostly you're working with people from the area, which is great. I mean, that's how you build those relationships. And they can be fraught and difficult at times because it's a work, it's, it's a job, it's a working environment, and you're typically you're a manager. Um, but these people are working, you know, a lot of the people that are on our teams are people that have been displaced themselves, refugees or IDPs, um, who really are emotionally tied to what they're doing, which is, which is great. Uh, it can also be difficult at times. Um, and you build relationships because you're working in their communities. Um, and that's, that brings you really, it's a lot closer. I think 
And when I was younger, I used to love to travel and go to new places and move around and see new things. And I think now I, I, I like being in one place for a long time because you can really build a relationship with people. And you end up going to weddings and you go to birthday parties or whatever life goes on. So you, you have that normal stuff that happens, which is, which is this element that you don't really think about. Wow. Um, so I have two questions from that. One, you mentioned IDP camps. What's IDP stand for? Sorry, so an IDP is an internally displaced person. So a refugee would be someone who crossed a border. Uh, an IDP would be someone that's fled conflict or natural disaster and is still within their country of origin. Oh, okay, okay. And my second question was, how does the Yemen culture or just any, actually no, how does the Yemen culture compare to American culture? Like what are some big takeaways? I'm, I'm curious. <laughs> Interesting, uh, vastly, vastly different. Um, oh, no, I don't know. I, I think devil's always in the details. They are, the Yemenis are quite a funny, funny group. They're extremely diverse. And that's one of the first things I noticed since coming. Um, Yemen is this historical crossroads, you know, uh, of East Africa and uh, the Middle East uh, and the Gulf countries. There's a big influence from India. A lot of the food has a Indian spin on it. Um, the people have various, you know, look vastly different. Uh, there's a lot of languages that are spoken. You have spices from East Africa. I mean, it's this huge crossroads of culture, which is really, really cool. And that makes people tolerant in a, in a, in a way of, they all still feel in a very Yemeni, regardless of what they look like or what their home language might be. We have staff that are speaking Somalia, they're speaking of heart from Ethiopia, they're speaking Arabic, they're speaking English. We have French speakers and just a massive um, mix of people. And I think what that is driven in Yemen is a different they really define themselves differently from their origins and as you minis, you know, they, they, um, holidays are a big deal in Yemen. They love to celebrate different things. Weddings are, are, are huge. Um, like weddings are such an important element of community where everyone really comes together. There's a lot of cross marriages of different backgrounds and cultures in Yemen. Uh, and that I would say the biggest thing that I noticed here in many other places is just that sense of community uh, people are really, really connected, and that's a, such an essential element of life. And that has negatives and positives, um, but it's it's everything is revolved around that. You know, I, I, the most shocking thing that I've ever said to my staff, and I, wherever I've worked, I said the same thing: is that I grew up and maybe I knew the names of a couple of my neighbors. You know, I lived in rural U.S. and they were they were shocked. So how could you not know everyone that lives in your town? That's absolutely absurd. And everyone's related, you know, like, whereas in the U.S. we're all, uh, a lot of, a lot of Americans are, you know, from families that came from various parts of the world uh, or moved around internally within the U.S. a lot. So, like, for example, my family, I don't have any extended family within a 10-hour drive of where I live. You know, I think that's, that's more common than not. Whereas in a place like this, you are related to half of your village because um, the families are so extensive. So that community is incredibly strong. Um, and that's one of the, yeah, it's definitely one of the biggest things that I noticed. Wow. Yeah, that's really funny that you say that you don't know your neighbors because I've been living in the same house since I was born and I still don't know my next door neighbor. So that's really awkward. Yeah. Um, and they've been here for 20 years too. So I definitely, I can definitely relate to that, not knowing who's living next to you. So that reminds me, um, just going back to these list of questions, what were the obstacles that you had to overcome? Just living, just like. Yeah. Um, so I think there's no, there's no um, set recipe on how you can enter into this work. There's a lot of people, a lot of different backgrounds. And a lot of it's just getting in the first time. I, mean, I, I sent uh, probably 50 applications to a million different organizations. And uh, I got one reply and I got lucky on an interview and, and was able to move very quickly. Um, and that was, once you get in, you start building personal relationships. The sector is very small. Every mission that I've, you know, country I've gone to, I'll know at least half of the people from a previous mission, or we know the same people, like one or two degrees separation max. Uh, so it's quite a small community. So once you break in, you're, you're set. Breaking in can be 
really difficult. I think the other obstacles, once you're kind of in, is you're thrown into um, you know situations that are very different. Oftentimes, you have a lot more responsibility than you're than you're ready for. In my first job, I was an intern, and I showed up, and they gave me. You know, I, t- I was on a team of 20 other people, uh, all Syrians. They gave me $100,000 I had to spend in you know three months and implement a project, and you just kind of you just kind of do. And that's not my experience is very common. Um, and those so those obstacles are very tough in the beginning, but you know if you have the right if you're if you're motivated and have a lot of energy, then you're gonna you're gonna push through and it's gonna be it's gonna be okay. But cracking in the first time is definitely definitely tricky. I'd say. Yeah, how many missions have you been on? Hmm. So I've been in let's see, India, Jordan, Tanzania, Iraq, Bangladesh, and now Yemen six um which is not a whole lot i would say for my this sector i generally stay a lot longer than other people um i think a lot of people do six months to a year i generally do a year to a year and a half i guess depending uh, i've done short missions and long missions uh, it just depends on what you're what you're up for right um can you explain what the syrian like your internship in syria what was that like yeah, so I was I was actually in, so I was in a Syrian camp in Jordan, so I was based in Jordan. Um, yeah, I was an intern with a with a French organization called Acted, which is a great great organization to start with. And you know, I had three hundred dollars a month, and but you know, we had housing. We lived outside the camp in the town nearby, uh, and Jordan was a great start because Jordan is very safe. You know, we didn't have a lot of security restrictions, so we can move around and go to the markets and 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 uh, buy all of our own food and, you know, kind of live normally, which was, which was nice. Um, but yeah, yes, yeah, so I worked in Zatri camp, which was a huge camp at the time. It was 85, 90,000 people. Um, it was a little bit further along. Maybe the camp had been established a year before. So it was a little bit more of a, a set, uh, an established camp. So that's a lot different than when you're building camps um, that I found out later. But, um, but yeah, I mean, we had a team, we had a lot of Syrians uh, on our team. You know, Syrians are very, very well educated and high capacity. So I was just kind of bringing an element of, I knew how to work the, you know, the, the humanitarian system generally works in, in English, unless you're working in French. So in Jordan, it was an English speaking mission. So I could you know, write the proposals and, and kind of link up into the humanitarian system. But the Syrian team did a lot of the work. Uh, I kind of learned, I definitely learned more than I would say that I brought. I was very lucky in that sense. But um, yeah, I was there for a year and formed really long lasting relationships. I'm still in touch with my uh, Syrian colleagues and Jordanian colleagues. Uh, and that was, you know, six, five or six years ago. Um, but yeah, but you dive in, you, you, you showed up and it was go, go, go. And we work, you know, 14 hour days minimum and, and you really just kind of push. It, it, was, it was great, it was a great experience. Yeah, it really sounds like you have to put yourself in like a good mental state and put some time aside just to de-stress because it's not it's not like a regular nine to five job where you can just be like, oh, I'm getting some pizza. Does anyone want any? Um, it definitely yeah. is a very intense job. Would you say that's correct? Very high. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, are there still obstacles that you're trying to overcome still yeah yeah uh countless um i think what's you know what's there's a lot of technical things that you never really learn so a lot of humanitarian work my experience is project management so i still have to learn how to do finance i still have to report i still have to budget and use excel and use all these all these things to properly manage uh, and utilize the funds from donors in the appropriate way uh, so technical skills like that are, are still really tough. I think um, being able to gain perspective is something that's still tough. And when do you when do you dive into a detail that might not have you know you're going to put two or three hours into one issue? It might not be worth the two or three hours. And, and I've gotten better at judging what is what's worth my time. But when you're in an environment where you just there's just so much to do and it's never ending. You know it's, it's just never ending. Um, being able to, to sit down and select what are the things that you need to focus on is really, really important. I think 
in my experience, it's always, I've learned more and more just to trust the, trust the teams. I mean, they know what's going on much more on the ground than I do. Uh, so listening more than talking is definitely something that I've learned more and more. Um, that's important. And then I think what's also interesting now is in trying to take kind of bigger world politics that are, are big dynamics that are happening in these, in these contexts. You know, context now, like Syrian context, or Yemen, or Iraq, or Congo, or Tanzania, or Tanzania refugee, or Burundi. These are huge conflicts that have a lot of international actors. Um, and you can start to predict what's going to happen, and you can start to navigate how to influence those actors. And that's what I'm trying to move into now and understand and be better able to, to navigate. Yeah. Um, what are some things that you're trying to constantly improve on? Would you say trying to navigate better or? Hmm. Um, constantly improving on, I, I would say, hmm, that's a great question. Um, I think, I think so much can be said for just having really strong management skills. Like really, are you able to handle conflict on a team? Are you able to um, allocate tasks appropriately? Are you, are you able to know when there's tension within a team that you know, could be personal tension or not? And being able to really be in tune to your team dynamics, I think is something that's so, so important. And, um, and that becomes further complicated when you, I mean, I live with a lot of my colleagues, you know, we're friends, we hang out after work, we, we, we do everything together because there's not a lot of other people around. So we, we do everything together, so we have personal relationships, which can complicate your work-life balance and your, your professional relationships. Uh, so I think that, that management I, I, is, is, so, is so key in being a good team player and being a supportive colleague. Um, it's something that I'm always trying to always trying to work on. And then personally, um, yeah, what I find interesting is the, uh, the pace at which we make decisions. You know, I think at school, uh, in my, my university experience, like you have a lot of time to think about this. And that's great. And that's amazing. You know, you, you think about paper for a week and you do it the last night, but at least you're thinking about it. And in this work, you're kind of, you have to go trust your instincts a lot. And you have a very little short amount of time to make really important decisions um, and really big decisions. And I think that that, that, that speed of decision-making and then that changes through like my new work now where I'm doing more policy work, my advocacy work. Um, I have less things to do, but they require so much more thinking time, which is kind of a funny switch for me to make. Uh, whereas I got very used to kind of making fast decisions and okay with that. Now I have to kind of slow down, step back, take my time, be patient um, and make decisions. So the pacing is really, really interesting that I'm trying to improve. Right. Is this your first time as a project manager too, or have you had experience in the past? Um, no, so I started doing project management 2016 in Iraq. That's when I really was a project manager, uh, but I started managing teams before that. Um, but really, I would say past three years, three, three, four years have been more project management. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I am... I guess this is kind of really, it's not, I'm trying to relate, but I really can't, but I'm an assistant station manager for my radio station. So I definitely, I, I'm new to that position. And it's definitely hard to like, you know, sense like, oh, no one's really getting along at this moment, or maybe we should like move to yeah. something else. So yeah. Do you have any advice for people who are interested in project management or just being a manager in general? Yeah, uh, listen, you know, <laughs> that sounds so silly, but I, I think I really have, have, have worked on and learned the importance of listening and, and being, um, you know, emotionally aware of how your colleagues are feeling. Uh, I, I think, you know, if you talked to me five or six years ago, I would have said that that's kind of hokey or soft. And, and now I, that is just so crucial if you can, if you understand how your colleagues are feeling, how they're perceiving challenges. Uh, and listening to what they have to say, um, yeah, it's such a such a basic skill set that I that I hadn't developed uh, nearly as much as I thought that I had. You know, listening is not just waiting to talk. You know, it's really trying to listen and understand and and how people are doing, and and that goes for everybody. Um, and it goes for what's interesting is that I, you know I, I 
my counterparts are many times people that I don't agree with. You know, I, I have counterparts, you know, I have to liaise with the military, I have to liaise with local authorities who may or may not have the best interests of their populations at mind. Um, and those can be tough, tough conversations and negotiations and, and listening to them being empathetic instead of sympathetic is something to really understand where they're coming from because one that best prepares you to negotiate. So there's definitely an element of you know putting yourself in the best position to do what you have to do, but but two, it allows you to to understand the context um, so much more. That was a bit of a, a rabbit hole, but I would say also I I, I hear people I imagine people's dreams um, being shaken by this, but like basic skills like oh, I wish I took an Excel course in college. I would just make my life 10 times easier sometimes when you're dealing with huge budgets and spreadsheets and stuff, which sounds incredibly boring. And to me it is, but it's definitely part of the, um, yeah, it's part of the work, you know, stuff that yeah. you want to do. Yeah. And it's interesting that you say, you know, listen, because at my university, I feel like they really want people to like debate and argue. And I think yeah. that's just, I think that I don't know if that's just a Western thing or it's just a higher education thing or just a human thing. But it's like all of our lives, at least in my school system, we never were valued for how well we listened. It was more like, oh, well, you made a better point. You get extra points where it's like, <laughs> like I don't want to argue. Um, so it's definitely... It's one of those things where, like, they teach you at such a young age to always listen and you take it for granted. But it really I is think, one of the most important things in life. I think what's interesting, too, it's interesting you say that and I, I reflect on that as well. Like, what I find when you're in a humanitarian context, many times you're not, you are not the most powerful person in the room. You know, you, if you liaise with the military actor or the police, I mean, they're in charge, right? They can either officially or unofficially. Um, they have the upper hand. Right? You, there's not much you can do about that, um, other than build relationships, you know, and, and to get and to understand where they're coming from, to either best maneuver them or to build personal relationships, which is something that you have to do, um, to to best advocate for the needs of the population, to ensure that they have access to their rights, and and listening is, you know, if I'm debating, I can beat them in debate, but they just might not care. And many times they just don't. You know, and then I, there's nothing I can do, right? Like I could have all the arguments lined up and I could, you know, beat them every single day. It doesn't matter. So yeah, that listening is so important to building those relationships and empathy helps to, to understand their position and to best navigate it. But also you realize that there's a lot of different ways to look, look at a context and a situation. Um, you know, I, I, I always amazed at our colleagues in Iraq and we were operating you know, a mile or two from the front line with, with, with ISIS and, and a lot of our family, a lot of people in the sites were coming from areas that were previously held by ISIS. Maybe they were potentially supporters of ISIS at one time, but it doesn't matter. You know, they're, they're fleeing the conflict, they come into a camp, they're civilians, we treat everybody the same. That's part of the principles that we abide by. Um, and my staff were from the area. You know, my staff were people that were impacted by that conflict, very personally. You know, everyone has been personally affected by the wars and there. And, and, still they were able to sit down with those families and find commonalities and, and advocate for their rights and work hard to provide them food and shelter and everything when you know, they're emotionally invested and impacted by this, this context. That's really something I learned from my, from my staff uh, to be able to empathize, especially when people that you just do not agree with. I mean, you, you have very different worldviews and very different principles. Um, it's really important. Yeah, especially when you're coming from Western culture and you're placing yourself in a comp in Eastern culture, it's just, it's always going to butt heads. So that's, yeah, that's, um, I was going to say, what are your favorite and least favorite parts of this work? Favorite, yeah, I mean, I favorite would definitely be those relationships. Um, the staff is huge. And also, it's just, it's just so interesting. I mean, you come to these areas that you know, don't know a whole lot about or you know, you've know you been able to read before going in. 
um, and you, you learn so many of the nuances of life here and, and wherever you are, and that's just, there's always an element of that. It's just exciting, and, and that's, that's great. Um, but really, those relationships, like, I think I could do this work anywhere in the world, and I would find that element of it um, as, I, as I get older. That would be, you know, really, really fulfilling. The least favorite. Oof, I, I'm terrible, terrible at reporting. I hate reporting, I hate writing reports still. Definitely one of my least favorite things to do. But I would say, um, yeah, I mean, I, I would, what's really tough is that the expectations are so high and many times uh, organizations don't, don't realize that and you, you get really pushed, you, know, you really get pushed to your, to your limit and you, quali you, you know, sacrifice quality for, for quantity. Um, and that can become frustrating when you really want to sit down and take time with something and just can't. Maybe that's by the context. Maybe that's just the stresses of work. I and mean, when we have the same issues, you have HQ asking for something sometimes that to me is just bottom of my priority list. Absolutely. But it's, you know, the, the hammer comes down and you have to respond. So that can be frustrating when you see the needs that are so right in your face and your teams are talking to you and you have to kind of allocate your time to something else. That doesn't happen a lot, but when it does happen, it can be really, really jarring. Um, and also too, like, like I was saying before, we, we can, it's not, yeah, I think I, when I reflect on what I said, it sounds more rosy eyed, but um, you end up, you can be very frustrated by the, by different actors that you have to work with. And no matter amount of listening or empathy or whatever uh, is gonna get you over that. And that can be very tough to have to negotiate with people that you don't, agree with or you think that are endangering lives or are actively endangering lives um, and that can be it, it can be motivating oftentimes and it can drive you to do more of it when you're in space for a long time you have to do that for a long long amount of time uh, that can really that can really wear on you and I think that's yeah I mean that's that's the tough part of the job how many people are in a sector and is it only your sector that's working on the mission so, so the humanitarian, uh, yeah, maybe I've mixed up some terms. So in the, the humanitarian sector, good question. I don't know how many people globally or I would say like within an organization like ourselves here in Yemen, we have, I think, 600 staff, um, national and international. Uh, but we also have a you know, budget of $50 million a year, so it's quite, quite big. Um, it, when it comes down to team size, maybe that's what you're looking for. So I had a team of, I had a team of 20 people, which I was managing that we were directly working with our communities. Um, but uh, that was kind of my specific team. We have sub teams, you know, maybe, maybe an office where you're implementing kind of water projects and building shelters and distributing food. You're gonna have 100 to 200 people in an office. Um, Yes, they can get quite, quite big, quite fast. Uh, and this sector in general, so in Yemen, for example, I'm in the south of Yemen. I'm in Aden uh, along the southern, southern coast. I think there's maybe 150 internationals across UN and INGOs that are here. And then I imagine the national staff numbers, the full team numbers are probably you know, mid 1000s, 2000s. It's big. Okay, so it's at first when you were thinking team, I was like six people. I don't know why I thought six people, but yeah. <laughs> it's still for the amount of work and all, all the work that you are doing, I feel like 20 people isn't enough or is it enough? Could you give mm -hmm. some pointers on that? Yeah, um, good question. It all comes down to how much money is available. So I mean, in a, in a perfect world, we would be able to go out there and build everyone a cement house and, and build roads. And, and if we had all the money that does exist in the world, it's just not always allocated to these, these contexts. So you're limited by the funding that you can get. Um, and also what I'm not mentioning is that a lot of our, if we're gonna build a house, you know, generally we hire workers from the community to build that house. You know, it's not, my team are not out there like nailing, nailing, beams together. I'd much rather give someone a job to nail beams together and my team can make sure that things can get stolen or they do it in the right way or whatever. So I so saw our, our real direct kind of, yeah, I guess payroll can get expansionally, like exponentially much, much bigger. 
Um, but it's an interesting question, but I think, in the humanitarian sector that maybe, you know, this is another rabbit hole, but when is something no longer an emergency? Yemen has been in conflict for six years. Um, we have people that are being displaced by very fluid front lines all the time. When do you stop just giving people bottles of water and food and, and start moving into installing water networks, you know, instead of, I can spend money and send a water truck to fill up a water tank every single day, that's going to be really expensive, or I can spend money and dig a well and, and put a solar pump on it and pump water all the time. Um, and that's, that's, that's an interesting question about how we utilize the money that's available and how, where our teams put their, put their efforts. Um, and that depends on how much, you know, like how much need there is and how you define it. Um, so it's, it's, it's a really tough question. Yeah, it's a good question. It's really, but it, it's got a lot of, a lot of elements to it. Um, when you said that you're worried, like this, when you, it, when you mentioned it, it made me wonder, did you ever have a problem where you hired someone to build houses or help out in the community and they stole from you or something went extremely wrong? Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, you're working in areas that have you know, people that are in desperate situations um, that do things for, you know, their own reasons. You're working in areas where you have a lot of people who don't agree with you that might try to actively stop what you're doing. That happens a lot. Um, not everybody wants people to be taken care of well. Uh, and I think that's something that you realize that it'd be a lot easier if everyone agreed with us that these 10,000 families need water. That's not always how it works. Um, different people try to sabotage that. They try to gain leverage over you. They try to negotiate with the well-being of those people. Uh, so that stuff happens on, on teams, definitely. Um, and that's where I think where the sector, the humanitarian sector is getting better is that we have a lot of mechanisms to try to stop that. So we have, you know, we have hotlines, we have uh, ways that people can file anonymous complaints. So someone in the community could file a complaint about me or they can file a complaint about one of my staff members and they, we make sure that they know that. Um, we actually have sessions where we move around the camp and we distribute cards with phone numbers on it uh, saying if anyone is of our staff has done something that you don't like or is, is not right or is against the rules or against the law, call this phone number and we have an entire separate third party team that will come and investigate those cases. Um, and that's important because that gains you that trust with the communities. They know that there's a huge power dynamic if, if you're um, someone that's been displaced, you don't have a lot of resources, you're dependent on an organization for things. Um, we need to ensure that they have an ability, a way to keep us accountable for uh, the way that we're utilizing our funding or the way that they're being treated. Uh, it doesn't happen a lot, but, but uh, these things happen and, and organizations are getting better at trying to stop that. Say. Yeah. Um, and for the groups that don't want to help people like have a better quality of life and try to stop what you're doing, has it ever got to the point where you were like, this is life threatening or I, I can't do this anymore? Mm. Or is it just more um, my than a complaint and you're like, ah. <laughs> like more, more, more option two than option one, but it, it has happened. I mean, there's, there's been instances where we had to leave. Uh, there's been instances where um, our staff had been threatened um, either at home or by phone. I mean, this happens, this happens quite a lot. Uh, and we have to, you always put the safety of your teams first. So whenever there's a threat, uh, we'll pull out. And generally, I mean, if, if, if uh, a majority of the people where you're working, if they don't want you there, then you don't go. You know, we go based on community acceptance. And and if there is somebody that is trying to stop us, um, we, we are transparent and we'll, we'll tell. We'll, we have lots of people that we know, we have, um, community leaders in areas that we're working. And if we have to leave, we'll call up our community leaders and we'll say, this is why we have to leave. We have to leave for a week because we've been threatened. And normally they'll sort it out. They have their own ways to have their own use their own mechanisms to talk to that person or to you know, try to gain leverage over that person and they'll call us and say, okay, it's safe for you to come back. We'll make sure it's safe for you to come back and then we'll, we'll go. Um, so a lot of our security is, is, is you know, 
majority of our security is based on that community acceptance. You know, we don't, we never move with armed escort. We don't move with armed vehicles. We don't wear flak jackets. We don't wear helmets. Um, we, you know, we move around and, and people know who we are and they want us there. And if they didn't want us there, if they don't, we leave. And um, that's for the safety of our teams, but it's also for, you know, we're not trying to impose anything on anybody. If you don't want our help, then there's plenty of people who do. Um, yeah, so we'll go there. Yeah. Um, did you ever have to move around Yemen for safety reasons, or were you able just to be stationed in South Yemen your whole time there? So in August of last year, a number of uh, internationals um, left. I'm not going to say evacuated. Evacuated is a loaded term. Um, but there was uh, Aden, where on base is the main city in the south, was overtaken by two competing parties. So the, I mean, the war is a complicated dynamic of north versus south. But in the south, you also have multiple actors that are fighting. Uh, in August of last year, there was a fight for the control of the city, and one group took over from another. And we were, there's only two of us that were here at the time. Uh, a number of organizations had their staff leave, so they had to call in a boat that was escorted by a warship, come and pick everybody up and, and bring them to Djibouti, um, which is by 12 hour sail away. Um, we made the choice to stay. We felt that we were safe where we were. The fighting was not about us, you know, no one wants, no one wants us to be hurt. Uh, so you're just kind of in the crossfire. So we just, you know, we have a safe room, we hunkered down, um, ate a lot of, you know, really warm uh, cornflakes and tuna cans and held out for a couple of days and it was fine. And the fighting, you know, there was a clear winner and the fighting stopped and we started moving around again. Um, and there's been a couple instances, instances similar we're normally pretty risk adverse, I would say, in the sector. Like no one wants anything bad to happen. So when we feel things are going to flare up, we will preemptively leave if we can. But sometimes we are we are stuck in situations. So either you got you to choose if you're going to take the risk to go or you're going to take the risk to stay. Um, so yeah, so I've been lucky, been very lucky in that sense. So I've um, always been able to stay. But there's definitely been times when when that personal risk has. I mean, it's it's real. It's a uh, it's definitely a thing that's that's important that you need to be aware of. Yeah. Um, and what is the situation like in Yemen right now? Because the only thing I know from media is that it's quoted as like the worst humanitarian crisis that we've seen. Is it true? Like, and I know they're being hit by COVID, but you have more information. I'd like to know more. Yeah, uh, yeah, Yemen is not not in a good place. Um, it, it's hard to know what is the biggest humanitarian crisis or the largest humanitarian crisis. Uh, Yemen is definitely up there in terms of people that are in need. Uh, the war has been going on for a long time. Um, Yemen is also a country that was, uh, you know, did not have a lot of infrastructure in place previously. There's been a lot of conflict in Yemen over the past 50 years. Um, so it was never. It was not that it was a fully functioning state that has now collapsed. It was. It was always very fragmented. Um, the fighting is flaring up again, unfortunately. So things are. I would say, yeah, militarily things are getting worse. COVID was hit pretty bad in May June. Uh, quite a lot of deaths. But the hard thing with COVID is that Yemen doesn't have capacity to test. So if you can't test, you don't really know how many people died from it and how many people are sick. So it was a big kind of black hole of information there that you can't really do much about. Um, there are funding shortages. So a lot of the money that has been coming from international donors, countries to, to help fund the responses is, is running out. So that they're starting to shut down programs, so clinics are shutting down, things that humanitarian partners can do are getting less. So that's not, it's also not good. Um, and yeah. Well, and economically, the Yemeni real, the economy is, is plummeting sort of huge rates of depreci depreciation, which means, you know, um, obviously the prices in the market go up and salary stays stagnant. So it's not, in short, it's not, it's not looking good. Um, however, uh, Yemenis are certainly the most resilient people I've ever met. And 
when you when you say something like that, you it gets you really down. But then when you go out, even some of the toughest locations where we work with the worst conditions, uh, people are incredibly yeah resilient. You know, people. Are, I, I've seen people here dig hand dig wells. You know, before we were able to reach them, you know, they dug a well 20 meters deep by hand, and they're pumping water out of it, and they're out, you know building their own boats and going fishing, and they're unbelievably crafty. Um, and they have strong communities. You know, they're not they're not individuals out there surviving by themselves. You know, families oftentimes move together with their entire village. You know, so you have groups of 10 or 15 families. That's you know, that's 50, 60, 70 people that all move together. And they work as a unit and then uh, the men go out and then try to find work and the women will go out and uh, you know make baskets or make the houses or do whatever they have to do um so it's it's not as dire on the ground as as it as it would seem there's definitely yeah there's definitely a lot of work to be done now. wow um just the fact that you said that people are so resilient that's extremely admirable and they they hand made a, a well yeah <laughs> yeah that's not even that's that's uh that's a simple example i mean what people will do is, is absolutely thing. incredible yeah it's, it's it's unbelievable it's unbelievable i mean people are so so incredibly creative and smart and uh yeah resilient it's really it's really something to see it's really amazing yeah. I'm surprised that you said that was a simple creation. I'd like to know more, but um, I guess <laughs> that's just, Ooh, I can't even, I can't even make a pizza. Um, my, uh, so my next question would be, you know, what do you think you will do next? Do you think you will continue in this field or would you like to move somewhere else or like move on to another career? Yeah. <laughs> great question um that's that's tough uh i mean the sector is i mean anyone anyone that's interested in going into a humanitarian sector whether you're going to work in your own country or you're going to work in other countries uh there's certainly a price to pay in terms of being away from family um you know you miss things you miss weddings you miss birthdays you miss important life events and that and everyone is always that's tough, you know, it's tough to be away from your family. It's tough for your family, it's tough for yourself. Um, and that's something I think that everyone everyone faces. Um, I think that there's a lot of things in this work that I'm finding that does transfer to work. I wanted to work back home, um, wherever that may be. I mean, there's so many things that needs to be done. Uh, you know, there's, there's tough places and extremely tough conditions in areas in the US. And, and, the West um, that where you can put your efforts towards. I think it's about finding that that balance um, of being able to be you know, identifying what are your personal priorities uh, in terms of family and friends and relationships and and what are your kind of work and professional priorities and what are your principles uh, that you want to uphold and where you can you can kind of let all those things relatively match. They're never going to line up perfectly. And I think someone like me, I'm at a I guess I'm at an interesting phase where I've you know, been in the field you know, for a while, six, seven years, and quite a bit of experience, which is good. Not, not as much as a lot of my colleagues, and some people stay in the field for forever. They, they move around for missions every couple of years, and that's, that's perfect for them. I don't, I don't know if that's for me. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure. Yeah. Wow, so pardon if you said it, but you are interested going back home to the States and just settle down there? Uh, maybe, yeah. I don't know. Um, do I think that I can find work that I think is meaningful and that fits my, my values and my principles and is important in the U.S.? Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Um, do I think that that would fulfill all my, my personal goals? You know, I still love traveling. I still love going to different places. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure. I've, I've actually never really, other than working in bars and restaurants, I've never really had a career in the U.S. You know, <laughs> I went to school and then bounced around working, um, you know, kind of odd jobs until I landed my first my first gig. 
Um, a lot of people do transition out. So you can work for an HQ, for example, you could work in DC or you can be based in Europe and you can have more of a work-life balance. You can find somewhere in the middle where you're traveling half of the time, you're doing surge support missions or basically you're on call and you are at home for four months of the year and then you know, eight months of the year, you're kind of out doing missions and then you can kind of play with those, with those fractions uh, to kind of fit what you want. Um, but it's competitive. You know, a lot of people want to, say more people want to transition into an HQ position or a regional position or a place where you can have more of a work-life balance. Those opportunities are, are few and far between. Um, and, and when you do that, you lose your that personal connection with the beneficiaries, with the people that you're going to help. Um, and, you, and you lose a lot of those things that you've grown to really love about the work because you're just you're separated from the field. It takes a long time to build. You know, for me, I, you can't, this is, this is an oversimplification, but in, in my experience, if you really want to build something, you want to build a team, you want to build a system, you really want to have a, a long-term impact, it takes at least a year. It takes a year. Uh, you, can, you can go in, and I've done five or six month missions where you can go in and you can be part of something, and that's great. And you can, and you can help a lot. But if you really want to institute a system of change, um, minimum a year, minimum, absolutely minimum. Uh, and then if you start moving into things where you're doing field visits every once in a while, you're a technical advisor, um, you're supporting other people do that, which is fine, but you lose that, that personal satisf satisfaction of really engaging that. So I think that's my decision, basically, is when do I want to lose this aspect that I really love about the work and then, you know, get things like a, a flat and, you know, I have, I have my personal items scattered around the world at the moment, so I have no idea where anything is. And uh, that would be nice one day, I think. Yeah, I I like how you mentioned that it takes a full year, especially with a team, to make change. Because, you know, especially in university, everything's quick. They, especially like with organizations and just with classes and everything, you, like yourself, you like create these expectations that, they're huge, but you can't accomplish them in a year. You can't even accomplish them in six months. But I feel like just the idea that everything is way too fast paced, it kind of takes away the actual dedication of the work. Like you have the idea, but you don't have the time. So I'm really glad you said that because I feel like, you know, a lot of students, I'm one, we're very impatient <laughs> and we want everything just like that. So it's really just important to really like look back and like see, do you have the time to actually complete it? Um, but yeah, thank you for that. That was extremely helpful. That's gonna stick in my head for the rest of my life. Yeah. But <laughs> um, I was the same, you know, I was the same. Like I was super impatient. I wanted things to happen. And I don't think that's always such a bad thing. I think that gives you that energy. You kind of, you have, you have to learn that through experience, you know? So like young, young, young people that are starting out i love working with 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 them because they're just they have that impatience which can be uh difficult at times but it's also just super great to have that energy and that kind of like oh, i want this done now and and that that's amazing that i love working with that and I, I was like and i still am in many ways um but you become more nuanced and you mature and i i think it requires everyone you know you require people that are more experienced that can step back and slow down and have a big picture view and be measured and, and you know what i would call boring uh, and then you have those people that are just like done 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 and, and want to move and and push and that clash is that the clash between those people is important and if you're working in a good team a good organization you foster that and you, you help that drive you and you um and that's good that conflict is is, is essential and i think that's great and, and i think young people entering the sector is is super important to bring that uh, and and, and It'll always be there. And there's no way to learn other than doing. So like, no matter what, I mean, no one's going to have a perfect course that's going to teach you the right nuances of, of patience and going to a sector and be able to implement. And I think that's, that's good. Yeah. Also like the downside of, because I'm very impatient, the downside of being patient and energetic is that you want like the craziest ideas to come out in like a week. Um, so yeah. for example, my radio station, we have a huge budget this year. And we're like, let's get a life-size cannon 
and turned it into a t-shirt gun and everyone's like <laughs> our supervisor's like no and i'm like i will make it yeah. like yeah it was so it really just depends like yeah great ideas but you know you need to give yourself time to actually do them maybe i'll get mm. that can- i will let you know um but the mm. last question i have for you is what else would you like to do if you could Hmm. I think the best way to look at that for me is, you know, you have different phases of implementing change, you know, and, and uh, what, what, what I do here, what I've been doing are band-aids. You know, we have, we have people that have been displaced and, you know, their first 72 hours is where we try to implement. And that's giving them food, giving them water, basic shelter. That's not, that's not sustained change. You know, you, you can, you can build up to that. And we do some of that. We do a lot of over the course of that year, we're trying to build in, you know, a lot of different things with community groups and giving them tools to kind of, if they have to displace again, it wouldn't be so jarring this time, giving them livelihood opportunities and stuff, and and that's good. I also see the the limitations in in, you know, in that, um, and I think that more I, I, stuff like like uh, you know climate work is going to be so important. Climate is going to be a driver of so much displacement and conflict in the coming years uh and that's super i think you're muted yeah sorry yeah. my my dad was yeah sorry ah. go ahead sorry no worries um yeah so like things that are change change that's like um you know more sustaining uh is is i see the importance of that it requires everybody you know um you know development for example is one sector that is generally slower, but it's it's uh, more sustaining than than humanitarians that are running around trying to put and that's that's okay. We need both, um, and I can see myself starting now wanting to see the other the other side of it because when you work in a humanitarian sector, you have kind of standard activities that you do everywhere, which is good because it makes you quick. You know what you're doing. You can apply similar techniques to different contexts. You're kind of like a it almost becomes more manual labor than it would be kind of you know, thinking labor. Um, and that's important, but tra- transitioning to something a bit more long-term, I think is something I'm interested in, particularly with climate change, particularly with uh, yeah, human rights stuff is always is, is interesting. But, uh, but for me, I, 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 like to, I like to work in teams, I like to be tangible, I like to implement. Um, so I think, uh, yeah. Good question. Sometimes I think I just want to, you know, work on a farm and just really <laughs> localize. <laughs> just, you know, uh, I think that could, that's also very admirable and important work. And uh, yeah, it, um, but in this field, you have the oppor- you have opportunities, you know, you, you can change. Uh, you can always go back. You know, such a wide range of people and experience. I work with people that were waiters and bartenders that are some of the best humanitarians I've ever met because they can operate under a lot of pressure in a very short amount of time, remember lots of things. And I've worked with people that have gone to school and were did a PhD humanitarian work that weren't particularly useful. And then you could reverse it. Um, anyway, I say that because it's the nice thing about the sector is you can go in and you can go out and it takes a lot of different types of people have uh, can succeed in the sector and you can get into it if you, if you get lucky uh, and you can kind of prove yourself and you can, you, can, you can launch and you can lead the sector and do something completely different. Wow. Myrna Pasquale, thank you so much for joining us. This was a very, very informative interview and I'm really glad I got to talk to you. All right. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Your, your great questions and uh, I hope, hope it was helpful. Thank you. I'll let you know when I make my canon. Um, by the way, yeah. what time is it over in Yemen? Uh, we're seven hours ahead. <clears throat> Eight hours ahead. It's nine nine p.m. now. Oh, okay. Uh-huh. Cool. Yeah, it's it's two p.m. over here. Um, but yeah, this was really great. Also, I do a music history show, so if you have any um, music that you've experienced, like your time abroad, let me know, and I want to learn more about yeah. it because huge music person um but other than that it was really great meeting you yeah you as well thank you so much all right take care bye-bye